Today is the day I will not sit still and give in anymore. Today I rise. I am bruised, but I will get up and walk again. Today I rise. I don't care if you ignore my beauty. Today I rise. Through the alchemy of my darkest nights, I heal and thrive. Today I rise. Through the world with confidence and grace, I open my eyes and I am ready to face my wholeness as a woman and my limitless capacities. I will walk my path with audacity. Today I rise. With the many aspects of myself, I'm in awe of the reality I can create. I am a queen. I am a healer, a wise woman, a wild woman. I will rise and be. I am a rebel. I will wake up and fight. I am a mother, and I am a child. I will no longer disguise my sadness and pain. I will no longer suffer. I am black and I am white. There is no reason to hide. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I call. Kali to kiss me alive. I transform my anger into power. No more heartache or strife. The world is missing what I am ready to give. My wisdom, my sweetness, my love, and my hunger for peace. And the rivers and the earth in distress. I rise and shine, and I'm ready to go on my quest. Today I rise without doubt or hesitation. Today I rise without excuses, without procrastination. Today I call upon my sisters to join a movement of resoluteness and concern. Today is my call to action. I will fulfill my mission without further distraction. Today is the day. Today I will start to offer the world the wisdom of my heart. So the theme of the film um, today, I rise, very much in line with the theme for our program this evening. We're looking at feminine power and powerful change. Our urgent need to reconnect with the wisdom of the feminine, the power of the feminine, is now more than perhaps we dare to realise. The qualities of the feminine are needed as we begin to shape the future world our hearts long to see. For centuries now, feminine wisdom has been denied, has been marginalised, repressed, subjugated. This imbalance between the masculine and feminine impulse is now being seen in the imbalance that we are witnessing. In the world around us. So, what do we mean by the feminine qualities? These are qualities that can belong to both men and women. And I'm sure each of us could come up with a different list of what we mean by these qualities. But here are just a few that I offer for your consideration. 
the ability to use intuition or higher knowing, the ability to listen deeply to the unspoken words of the heart, the voices of the many, the ability to act with kindness and compassion, with care and reverence for all life, the ability to love without limits, the ability to heal wounds through understanding and forgiveness, the ability to resolve conflict by dissolving it with empathy and love, the ability to honor the sacredness of the earth, to care for the earth as we care for ourselves, the ability to bring forth new life and nurture it, not just the well-being of the next generation, but the generations that are yet to come. When we deny or subjugate the feminine, we deny something fundamental to life. Well, let me introduce you to our speakers who are going to be guiding us through this subject as has been reflected in their own lives. It's a warm welcome back to Amish Tripathi, who is, of course, the director here at the Nehru Center. He's India's publishing sensation, who wrote the fastest selling books in Indian publishing history while sat on the back seat of the cab that was taking him to and fro work. And his retelling of the great Hindu mythologies have given some of the best parts to women, but not women as have traditionally been portrayed. These are fearsome warriors who demonstrate the skills required for true leadership, standing up for justice, defending the weak, supporting those in need, making decisions that were hard but were the right thing to do all whilst fighting off a pack of wild dogs, single-handedly, and facing up to wild beasts that no man was able to conquer. They really are quite strong characters. Now, whilst I'm, I'm sure Sister Genty has never fought off a pack of wild dogs with her bare hands, she's pretty much ticked every other box in the checklist of Amish's strong women characters. Um, Sister Genty has walked the spiritual path since she was a teenager, devoting her life to the upliftment of humanity by teaching self-inquiry and the path of Raj Yoga meditation. For more than 50 years, she has traveled around the world, speaking at conferences, initiating movements of positive changes in over 120 countries. She is now the additional administrative head of the Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual University, which for the past 85 years has been a beacon of inspiration for women inspired spiritual leadership. And TV presenter Anita Rani has likewise been on a journey to realize her full feminine power and potential. As a Royal Television Society winning broadcaster and a career that spans 20 years, she's appeared on a huge variety of TV documentaries, current affairs and light entertainment programs, but perhaps she's best known to all of us for trudging around the British countryside in a pair of wellers um, whilst presenting BBC One's flagship program, Country File. She's also presented Watchdog, The One Show, and more recently, Woman's Hour on BBC Radio 4. And last year, she was announced as a UNHCR, that's the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, Goodwill Ambassador. And as if all that wasn't enough, she also last year published her first book, a memoir, The Right Sort of Girl, which made the Sunday Times bestseller list. 
a pretty impressive CV. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speakers to the stage. There we go. So, Amish, thanks for having us back again. My pleasure completely. Oh, it's not on, is it? Okay. My pleasure completely. My honor, in fact. We're beginning to feel very at home here. I think the next step will be that we just simply move in. Just settle right? in, settle in, settle in. <laughs> I seem to remember last time. My office is yours. Oh, oh that's Sukhan. so great. It's a nice office. That's so great. It's a great, great house, I have to say. <laughs> um, and, Sister Genty, you've arranged your schedule so that you could fly back from a recent trip to India to be with us here this evening. So it's fantastic that you were able to be with us as well. Thank you so much. So, Anita, you're the new girl here because you weren't here for the last session. So, a special warm welcome to you. Thank you. I feel very honoured to be here, actually. You know, on this panel, it feels very special. Well, the honour and the privilege is, is really all ours. And it, I have to say up front, if I, if I come across as overly familiar with you, it's because you've written your book in such a way as by the end of it, you really do feel like you've become a new best friend. It's a very <laughs> upfront, intimate no holes barred journey through your life, basically. Yes, yes, I, I, I said a lot. Um, <laughs> first of all, I have to say, I thought going to Blackburn tomorrow for country file was going to be a schlep, but coming from India, I think Sister Jenthi's like <laughs> got that medal for the, the longest distance travelled. Um, yeah, I, um, when I set out to write my memoir in uh, lockdown, when we were all in a very reflective, still space, particularly for someone who has such a frenetic life like me. I'm always here, there, and everywhere. And all of a sudden, I found myself, like all of us, at home, thinking, reflecting. And um, I wasn't expecting to say as much as I did. But as soon as I started to write it, it became very obvious that I had to say some real truths. And the, the premise of the book, the way I decided to write it, was as though I was writing it to my 16-year-old self. And as soon as you start from that point, you can't lie to your 16-year-old self because she's living it. She's there. She knows what's going on. So I couldn't pretend. And um, so I expressed a lot about what it, what, how, my experience of growing up in, uh, as, a, as a Punjabi girl in the north, um, my family history. It was really important to put the background in, give some context. But what it really meant to be a young woman um, growing up in that world. Um, and the day before the book came out, I was absolutely petrified and thought, what have I done? I've just exposed everything, and now my mum and dad are going to know most of my secrets. <laughs> Not all of them. Um, kept some back. Um, and I phoned a friend and I said, look, I, I feel sick to my stomach. What, what can I do? And he said, look, if you'd just written a book, say, of a, a woman who moves to London and gets a career in telly and that's it. And like every other memoir out there, how would you feel right now? And I thought it, I'd feel like it was the biggest waste of an opportunity to say something meaningful and important. Mm. And I know that I have grown up and in a world where women and girls are not supposed to talk about the things we see going on around us all the time. And I just wanted to lift the lid and talk about how... Um, how that impacted me. And thankfully, Philippa, the reaction has been good. <laughs> Even from the Punjabi community in Bradford. Oh, especially from the Punjabi really? community. Especially the women. Mm. I mean, across the board, actually. I'm very lucky. Um, across the board. But the conversations I've had, particularly with women, as we are here talking about feminine power, has, I, I've been in some mm. very powerful rooms where there's been no sort of surface conversation. We've gone straight in at a really deep level. And, it, and people have said, you know, finally... Finally, we, the things we were told to, we could never say were saying out loud. Amazing. I, I take my hat off to you because, you know, I consider myself to be fairly worldly wise. And yet there were quite a few moments in your book when my jaw was on the floor and I'm like, she's going to talk about this. 
yeah. about puberty. And there's, there's one rule in Punjabi families, and that is that you do not talk about puberty. Never talk about puberty. And, like, yet, like, and yet you did, but you also touch on some of the other um, major social issues, which, you know, in, in most cultures, people aren't honest about, like domestic violence or alcoholism or suicide. And, you know, you lost family members to suicide and you don't shy away from any of these big subjects. I mean, I'm from a migrant Punjabi family. Like, you go anywhere in the world, you'll get Punjabis and potatoes. Uh, and, as, and Gujaratis as well, you know, we're everywhere. Um, but uh, with that comes... And because we are a working-class migrant community, with that comes, oh, yeah, we have them all. We have every trauma you can name um, within our communities, and yet we don't talk about them. Mm -hmm. And it is, tends to be, the, it's the job of the women to keep a lid on all of that. So I just, and I've carried it, you know, as we all do. As daughters, we carry that. You talk about shame as oh, well. Oh, yeah. I mean, as women, uh, we, are the, we carry the, the burden of the shame and the honour of the family. And I talk about feeling as though I had this glass box on my head my entire life and I'm just walking a tightrope because it's not, it's not your honour and shame either, it's, it's your mother's honour and shame. And if you put one step wrong, then all of it, you're going to expose everybody. And, and that's a lot to put on a child. Absolutely. You know, and I, so all of a sudden I thought, I'm just going to see what happens if I just... And again, I was just, it was, really did come out of me almost like a meditation. It just flowed, and I didn't expect to go quite as deep as I did, but I'm, I'm really glad I did. I have to say, though, listening to... Because I listened to your audiobook, which is why I feel quite so connected to you, because it's quite intimate medium, isn't it? Yes. Um, you paint this amazing picture of, of the women in your life, who you call yeah. the Illuminantes, <laughs> which I thought was Yeah, the Illuminanti are like the KGB, MI5, <laughs> the FSB. They know that data is king, and they've known it forever. Yeah. They know everything about everybody. But the thing that struck me was that, that you had these fairly kind of um, competent women who really hadn't had the chance yet to shine. Yeah. And you tell the story of a woman who came from <coughs> India with her master's degree, and yet here she is earning her living um, you know, at a sewing machine. Um, and, and, and really their places in the kitchen and their places to, to really not necessarily be, be heard. And I wonder where young Anita got her inspiration from to say, do you know what? I'm not going to be like one of these women. Mm. I'm going to do something different and I'm going to do it my way. Mm. Where do you think, looking back now, that drive and vision came from? I don't know. I mean, my parents are very dynamic and I've got, I've, I'm lucky I've got very forward-thinking parents in that they wanted me to do all the things, like a lot of our parents did. They worked hard so that we could do and have lives that they never could. And, but my dad says, look, well, you just told us what you wanted to do. We just had to let you do it. We didn't really have a choice in the matter. But my mum was very encouraging. Mm. And, I, you know, she was kind of wanted to just be the... She wanted to be the rebel, the Bollywood actress, but actually, you know, she moved to, from India to marry my dad and moved to Bradford. And... Uh, and had to just get on with life. And you're right, you know, so I was surrounded by women, all the female role models, who were the most incredible women, did absolutely everything. My parents ran a manufacturing business, and they worked all the hours, just the two of them. And we'd come home from school to the factory and then home, and without fail, every evening, my mum would cook fresh roti for my father. Every evening. No matter what time, she would finish work. And... I mean, they are, this, that generation of women were amazing. My grandmother, equally so. However, growing up, I just thought, I don't want to be like them. Mm -hmm. This is not the sort of woman I want to be. This was my opinion, honestly. I just thought, I, I want a voice. I don't want to be hold. I don't want to serve someone chapatis every night. This isn't <laughs> going to be my life. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, so it was about making something of, and having a voice and a choice. Yeah. To, and the choice is the main thing. Yeah. They didn't have choice. And so that was really important to me, to go and ex find who I am. And then what you discover is actually they do quite a number on you whilst you're growing up as a kid and manage to drip, 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 drip. And so you think you've got a choice, but you don't have much because actually the pull of making sure that you make your parents happy is constantly there. And so for women, of, certainly of my generation, you are working really hard to become successful, and South Asian women in Britain are the most successful group because we know that no one else is going to do it for us. Mm -hmm. And also, we have no option but to succeed because we can't fail. There is no room for failure. 
So you try double hard at everything you do and make sure you're the best at everything yeah, you do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. someone said to me, I, may, I might possibly have a bit of a competitive streak. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know all the time. But yeah, I guess, you know, um, yeah, I get the bit between my teeth. Mm. And then when I moved to London and I, was, you know, I was, started working in telly and I just... It never crossed my mind that why wouldn't I be able to do these things? Well, let me tell you why it wouldn't cross your mind because one line that really jumped out at me was when you were born, it was reported that your grandmother said, mm. we don't celebrate girls. Oh, yeah. In other words, it's a girl, we're not going to celebrate. Yeah, legend has it that is my dad bought a crate of champagne. <laughs> now, I suspect it may have been Carver, but um, we'll stick with champagne. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and my grandmother said, we don't celebrate girls. Yeah. But, you know, that, again, my grandmother came... Uh, you, you, as an adult, you then put it into context. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say in modern day, but it was so normal, mm -hmm. and it still happens now. It definitely know. does. Yeah. I'd like to bring Sister Genty in here because there's a parallel <laughs> with the, um, the stories of some of the senior sisters within the Brahma Kumaris. Um, when they were born um, in, a, in not too far away from the Punjab in northwest India. And likewise, when they were born, it was seen to be so insignificant that the date of their birth was never even recorded. Um, and they were almost not much more than goods and chattels. What stories did you hear from, from the seniors in our organization about that time and how, how they had to rail against that? Um, there are amazing, powerful women in the Brahma Kumaris, and the founder had a vision of having women um, take on the role of teachers and leaders, because he felt that it was time to restore balance to the world. That would be justice, and if you wanted a better world, then justice was the foundation, and within that, justice for women in particular. And two stories that stick in my mind, um, Daddy Janki, who was in London for about 40 years, based here, and then became the chief of the organization and moved to India. And many of you perhaps knew her, and she passed away 104 years of age. Until a month before her transition, um, she was still serving. And then the last month was very quiet. But just imagine, 104, and she was traveling and serving. Well, that was the yoga power that she had. And she would say that I was not allowed to speak in front of men. And only in my own room could I speak to my husband. I couldn't even speak to my husband in front of my father-in-law or anyone else. Um, women's voices were just never heard. And so when she decided that she wanted to have a life which was a very different life, a life of surrender to God, um, throughout her childhood, she'd had that love for God. And then the opportunity came, and she did surrender. And she said that um, it was amazing when people would hear her because they said it was a lioness who was speaking. So how did this silent child, silent woman suddenly become a lioness? And so it was a spiritual awakening that happened within her that made that happen. And another woman who was a bit older than Daddy, um, her name was, um, she was from a very well-known, high-level family. And she said that she was married off at the age of 12, but she didn't go to stay with her in-laws. She went when she was 14. And the only reason why she was given an education, and it was only a certain limited education, um, so that she could write letters to her husband when he was traveling, and she would be able to do the laundry lists, and she would keep the household budget. These were the reasons why she was given an education. But why else would she need to? Because her in-laws and her parents' family had huge wealth, and she would never need to work. She would never need to do anything on her own. Um, but it just gives you an idea into that situation. And again, she was one who decided that when she had this awakening, um, this was in 1936. And so she decided she wanted to surrender her life to, to God and serve spiritually. And she became the head of our organization when the founder passed away. And her intellect was absolutely brilliant. So it was just a question of, at that time, the situation and circumstances. But then spirituality gave her a very different opportunity and she was amazing. Um, 
she could look at a person and it wasn't just her own brain, but it was also divine touching in uh, intuition. You mentioned about intuition earlier. So, and she would give me a picture of that individual who she had met just for a few minutes so that then I'd be able to guide them further in their life. And so she was really able to just simply read their mind in a sense. And it was amazing. So these are just two very simple stories of the transformation that spirituality brought in their lives. And of course, they went on to not just become leaders, but spiritual leaders, which in India at that time would have been unthinkable. Even to have any active role in a religious community wouldn't have happened. Um, and of course, now we have a situation in India where two days ago we um, had the new um, president of India, who is a woman from a tribal background. She's also part of the Brahma Kumaris, so we've got spirituality and leadership at the heart of government. So that's quite a journey, isn't it? Uh, that woman is also very, very amazing because she's been through so many tragedies, tragedies. in her life. Mm -hmm. And at the time when she was totally depressed, um, she reached out for spirituality, went to the center that was in Orissa. She was there. Um, you were talking about Orisa, this is why I mentioned Orisa. <laughs> and at that point, um, it was spirituality that gave her an injection of life and a new beginning. Mm -hmm. And through that power that she gained through spirituality, when, when she went through her second tragedy, uh, she was able to maintain a certain calm. But that second tragedy, first son left, second son left, and through that second tragedy, her husband left in a state of depression. And then her mother and her sister. So it was a whole, a sister or brother? Brother maybe, brother. brother. Um, so it was a whole series of things, but through all of that, her love for education, um, as a, she shares a story of how as a young girl, her father would only be able to educate her up to a certain level and he couldn't afford more. But there was a meeting in her community in the village um, in which the person who was an MLA, a member of the Legislative Assembly there, um, he was holding a meeting. And this young lady, 10 years old or something, she strides up onto the stage in front of him and says, I want to ask you something. And as a child, and she's got the courage to come up. And so uh, she's asked, what do you want? I want an education. I want to be able to have an education. Mm -hmm. And so that was the start of the arranging of the scholarship, and she goes on. And her total humility, her sincerity, won hearts, and she was serving people, and so she went through the ranks and finally was the governor, and today is the president. Fantastic yeah. journey. Yeah. I mean, Amish, I said about the strong women characters that you've written in your Shiva trilogy, and I'd like to talk about them in a moment, but um, I, I wonder where your passion for women's equality came from, given, um, you know, you've got one sister and, and, and brothers. Uh, how did you come to be so passionate about that? Um, I think we just grew up with it being a normal part of life. Uh, my uh, my grandfather was a pundit actually in Varanasi, uh, and love to say that I came up with these thoughts and <laughs> make me sound very cool, but it's actually not the truth. <laughs> it's actually not the truth. It's uh, because my grandfather had read many of the scriptures, mm -hmm. uh, our ancient scriptures, and uh, both my parents are also deeply religious. So we learned this as a part of our traditions, you know that. Uh, uh, equality between men and women is not a modern westernized concept, it's actually an ancient Indian concept. Uh, and things that are not taught to us in the Indian education system. So, I mean, for example, the oldest uh, Indian scripture is the Rig Veda, uh, which has been written by Rishis, the equivalent of, you know, prophets and messiahs of uh, Western religions. What many don't know is that the Rig Veda is hymns written by Rishikas as well, not just Rishis, women Rishis. We are the equivalent of women prophets and messiahs, not just goddesses. Women prophets and messiahs who've written the hymns which are there in the Rig Veda. You know, and uh, among the things I've said in interviews in India often to idiots who say <laughs> that women should not read the scriptures at certain times of month, yes. they wrote the scriptures yeah. 7,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah. right? We were that liberal. We had women 
who used to rule in their own name in India, Rani Prabhavati Gupta, two and a half thousand years ago, she ruled in her own name. Uh, wasn't like the wife of the king, you know, Rani Rudrama Devi, uh, for example, some 800 years ago, who used to lead her army into battle. So the stuff that I wrote in my books of women being prime ministers and doctors and warriors, uh, warriors, it's, it was a part of the normal place. The, the Chola Empire, for example, in the south, uh, they had a women's uh, regiment. Uh, the bodyguards of, of the king were, uh, were women. We had so this was actually a part of our way of life. So in our in our uh, family, for example, uh, we had the same set of rules. We had three brothers, one sister. Sister was the eldest. Uh, my parents established the same set of rules for all four of us. All four of us had to follow. There wasn't any special treatment uh, for the boys. Uh, you know, to the point even of you know not celebrating the you know the birth of a daughter. We used to have a Lakshmi puja. You mm -hmm. know, whenever any daughter is born which actually comes from the Brihadaranya Upanishad, our ancient Upanishad. When a daughter is born, you do a Lakshmi Puja because Goddess Lakshmi has come home. And you celebrate the birth of a boy as well. It wasn't anti-male, but this was actually what our traditions were. Sadly, we've, we've forgotten a lot of it. You know? So has there been any pushback from, from people in India that you're now rewriting these female characters as such powerful warriors that can, um, you know, fight off a pack of, of wolves with bare hands and things? No, not, actually, she had a sword at that time. She did. Uh, okay. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, no, not, none at all, actually. That's amazing, and, isn't it? Uh, my books by Lord Shiva's Grace have, uh, you know, been read quite a few. You can Google, you won't find one controversy around my name. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> Many of, uh, uh, you know, even political leaders on both the left and the right actually support my books. Their blurbs are there on my books. Uh, uh, I am not actually doing any... I'd love... Again, it would make me sound so cool that I'm doing something new. <laughs> but I'm not actually. I am reviving our ancient text. That's all. So, you know, seeing Goddess Sita... All of us have an impression of Goddess Sita, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the Ramayana but uh, which is based more on a television serial from the 1980s. <laughs> not the original Valmiki Ramayana. In the original Valmiki Ramayana, she is not so docile and submissive. Uh, and in fact, there is a very ancient version of the Ramayana called the Adhvot Ramayana, uh, which is also credited to the original author, Valmiki Ji, uh, which I quote in my books, in that the main villain, Ravan, is not killed by Lord Ram, he is killed by Goddess Sita. And there is a 3,000 year old version. Right? Yeah. There's, there's a, I'm sure everyone would have heard of that lovely Mahabharat line, right? Yada yada dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. When Lord Krishna says, whenever a dharma rises or dharma is in decline, Lord Krishna says, I will come. I will come. And I will say, that's, it's a very famous line. It's from the Mahabharat. There's a version of that line in the Adbhut Ramayana. Yada yada dharmasya glanir bhavati suvrata, apyutthanam adharmasya tada prakruti sambhava. That whenever a dharma rises, or dharma is in decline, remember, O keeper of righteous vows, the sacred feminine will incarnate. She will the defend dharma, feminine. she Whoa. will protect us. Wow. This is there in the Arbhut Rama, and the sad part of, I always say, actually, modern Indians, we are, we are actually unworthy descendants of really kick-ass <laughs> ancestors. Uh, Sadly, of, of what, sorry? We are, in many ways, unworthy descendants. Unworthy descendants. Of really kick-ass ancestors. Okay. We haven't read much of those things. Pa the patriarchy yeah. sort of turned up and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. did, a, did a number on us all, yeah. didn't they? You know, These are all, we don't have to make stuff up, mm -hmm. we don't have to import westernized. They're there in our text. All we have to do is read them. That's all. I mean, that's so empowering, isn't it, yeah. to think of these ancient, really ancient, not medieval, but pre-medieval texts yeah. Yeah. So celebrating the power of the earlier. feminine. 10th century earlier. 10th uh, century, century AD earlier. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the same has happened in, in Western Christianity. Um, the feminine has been, you know, marginalized so that the only kind of role models are, are either the Virgin Mary, mm. um, who's a, a, you know, a virgin mother, which for most people is, is quite a hard thing to achieve, um, <laughs> or, or else a prostitute. Yeah. And these are the two models for women. Yeah. Where do you go with that? No, don't. I mean, that's, it's very interesting. I mean, I'm so into what you're saying, uh, Amish. Uh, I, yeah, and I've watched... Uh, I've been, I used to go to the Mandir and we go to the Gurdwara and, you know, and we do Ganjika in Punjab and, mm. you know, lots of ceremonies around celebrating girl, child, children and celebrating goddess. 
However, it didn't translate into how women were actually treated within the home, and that, for me, is where mm -hmm. there is a big disconnect. Disconnect. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we, so you can go and it's so. Let's not put women. We don't want to be put on a pedestal. We just <laughs> yeah. want to be treated as equals. As equals, Absolutely. exactly. Yeah. Can I give one more ancient example? Yes. There's a lovely example. You know, before the British came and our education system was destroyed, we had there's a lovely book called Beautiful Tree. Okay, written by Dharampal ji in the 18th century. Uh, he based it on 18th century British Rajira records of what our education system was like before the British Raj took over. And we used to have Gurukuls, Madrasas, uh, Patshalas teaching. The main maths book that was used across India to teach maths uh, was this uh, text called Leelavati, written by Bhaskaracharya. It was a mathematical book. Okay, brilliant book, you must read it, all of you. It's available for free on the internet. My books are also available for free on the internet, as is hers, but that is illegal. Mine's not free. Mine's but that is illegal, that is illegal. Okay. But, but Leelavati is, is actually legal, it's a thousand year old text, so it is legal. The question is, who is Leelavati? Bhaskaracharya was a brilliant rishi. His daughter wasn't interested in mathematics. He wanted to interest her in mathematics. He wanted to teach her. So he wrote this text. This beautiful text where he speaks of Sanskrit poetry and teaches mathematics through it. And he named it Leelavati on her name. Mm -hmm. okay. So that she would get interested because he wanted to teach her mathematics. <laughs> this was actually the tradition. We've forgotten so much that is depressing. Mm -hmm. I suppose as, as a kind of <clears throat> an outsider looking in on, on, on what happens in India, there is this sense of the huge reverence of the goddesses. And you have the nine knights with the nine goddesses and women are kind of up there. And yet the disconnect, as, as Anita was saying, yeah, mm. between the worship of the goddesses and the reality of women's experience on the it's ground. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. And, and I know you, you said as well about you know, the infanticide that yes, still goes terrible. on in India. Yeah, um, so, so girl babies who, who are killed because they're girls. Yeah. You know, this is quite a stretch between those two paradigms. Yeah, it is terrible. And I, I, I've said it repeatedly that among the biggest crimes that happen and I've said it in India repeatedly on interviews. The biggest, uh, the most oppressed group uh, are actually women uh, in India. Mm. Uh, and uh, we need to fight this. The point is how to fight it. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, either we can fight it by, uh, by talking down the culture or saying there's a Western, uh, this thing, that will not work, mm. right? Or we can say actually this is what our culture was. Uh, and we had women teachers, we had women doctors, we had... Because there are texts which are there, right? Uh, and that you're not becoming Western in uh, seeing men and women as equal. In fact, you're being truly Indian. Well, also this idea, that this concept... has of, a higher chance of success. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm just... This concept that, uh, you know, equality is a Western ideal is complete nonsense. Yes. Look at what's <laughs> happening in America with... Roe versus Wade. Look at you know <laughs> we, even you know Britain. I present women's there every week. We're discussing just how we are just equality the world over. We're just not there. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. a big power struggle between men and women. Um, I just want to say that um, if you're looking at the situation of the past and what's happened, the patriarchal society and so on, um, can we look at what we can do today to be able to uplift women mm -hmm. so that then there can be that equality? And I see that there are two parts that actually allow that equality to emerge. One is education, oh. but the other is spiritual education. Yeah. And when there's spirituality, then you're able to go beyond the confines of what society says. A girl should do this, and she can't do this, or a woman can do this, and whatever. Because you come to that awareness of that inner light that is within every one of us, men yeah. and women. True. True. And so when a woman becomes aware that this body is special, it's precious, but actually my own identity is something else. Yes. Yeah. And in that spiritual awareness, then you're actually able to tap into two things. You're able to tap into the feminine energy, but you're also able to tap into the masculine energy yes. because the soul is not, doesn't carry a label of male or female. Mm. And so say, for example, um, there's a person like Mother Teresa, mm. a modern example, and yet um, she's not just a woman. She has those qualities that we would associate with the feminine 
uh, compassion and love and care, but she also had the courage to fight against the system and start whatever it is she wanted to do in Calcutta because the system was saying to her no, but she had the courage to fight the system and say, I am going to do this, and she carried that on. And then you've got somebody like Mahatma Gandhi, and on the one side, there's the power that he had to do all the things that he did, but he used the power of nonviolence, and so the UN actually celebrates his birthday, October the 2nd, as a day for nonviolence, and so that's beautiful. Yeah. But you can see men and women who have been able to demonstrate that there is an inner spirit in which you can have both qualities in balance. And that, once that awakening begins to happen, women are very definitely empowered. But men also begin to see that there's different aspects of their personality that can be expressed and emerged. Absolutely, because so, men are losing out as well yeah, because they're not given the permission to express that feminine side. Mm -hmm. But it, I'd like to move us on if I can. I, I alluded at the beginning to the imperative of embracing the feminine because of the world situation that we're now facing. And I, I wonder if there is a correlation between the way patriarchal culture has used women and abused women and the way in which we are using and abusing Mother Earth, mm. the planet, and, and seeing it as, as a way to increase profit. Mm. And that actually this is where the feminine qualities are actually most needed. And, and of course, Anita, you're presenting a you know, country file. And I wonder if you pick up on, on this sense of needing to shift our attitude towards the earth. I mean, Country File is a, an incredible program to work on. And when I interview um, people who work on the land and who are gatekeepers of the land, actually, they are very connected to the land. You know, I'm very kind of respectful of people who live in rural Britain and uh, particularly farmers and how hard they have to work to kind of continue to provide food. But in terms of what you're saying, I think you're right. You know, I think we're kind of the, the sort of... I don't, I, it's, I'm, I'm unsure whether I should call it masculine because I, I like you, I believe we are masculine and feminine, we hold everything within, within us because I'll tell you something, my book did not come out of love, it came out of rage. <laughs> and, I, and I'm telling you, uh, my feminine power it is fueled by rage. <laughs> Sorry to put it out there. I'm trying to find the love. I'm, I know there's love in there, but I'm allowed to be angry. Rage can also be a feminine quality. Absolutely. Yeah. Righteous indignation. Oh, I love my inner Carly. You know? yeah. she's, she's my rock star goddess. She's my rock star goddess. But yeah, I think that, that sense of ego that we have, that this, this is ours, we have complete ownership of this to do with it what we will in the same way that men have felt that they have ownership over women, their voices, their bodies. We only have to look at what happened. We're talking about the 75th anniversary um, of independence, but along comes with partition. Mm. And the huge tragedy that took place when India was severed and, mm. and what happened to the women in particular. And I believe that the land aches the land remembers. And so I think you're, you're absolutely right. We need to respect Mother Nature. And I think we don't even begin to understand the half of, of what this earth is feeling from what we're doing to it. So, Sister Genti, you've yeah. looked into this as well. Where, where have you landed? Um, I'm totally aware that it's the human exploitation of nature that has created a complete imbalance within the system and London impacted, well, the UK experienced climate change in a very dramatic way a little while ago. Um, and so there's no denial that until a few years ago, there were still people denying that there was human intervention that was responsible. Today, I don't think I, I hear those deniers anymore. Those skeptics have been silenced. And so it's human intervention in which we thought we could just take from Mother Earth without giving anything back in return. Mm. And so we've totally created as that state in which there's chaos in nature. And I do see that Mother Earth and nature itself are um, coming back with a backlash. Mm -hmm. And so where there's on the one side drought or there's floods, mm. well, that's nature rebelling. Where yeah. we see earthquakes and volcanoes, all of this is again nature signal that things are not right. 
viruses, global viruses, grinding that us to too. a halt. Yeah. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there's something that we can do about this. Um, one is not just to, within our own selves, cultivate that love and respect and sanctity of nature and treat nature with that respect but so that I, I reduce my carbon footprint so that I'm not taking more and more and more. But also I think that the power of the human mind is so great that if we were to send out our thoughts and God's remembrance of light and love to nature, I think that can help nature become calm and cooperative and harmonious with human beings again. So I think that you can do both things, the physical, the practical, yes, have renewable energies. And in Mount Abu, um, we have, since the last 25 years, we've been using renewable energies. And I think we are the largest single um, industrial community users of renewable energies in India even today. And we've got um, a solar thermal plant that's there at the bottom of the mountain. Mm. So yes, do all of those things on a physical level, plant lakhs and lakhs of trees, which is again what we're doing. There's a big campaign going on for that. But also I think that silently sending out good vibrations to nature, it's like you know when a person is sick, a prayer can work, prayer can happen, can make healing happen. In the same way, sending out vibrations to nature can heal nature and bring back a state of harmony again. Hugging a tree is very good as well. <laughs> <laughs> Makes Sharing you feel great. Good vibrations. Yeah, good vibrations. <laughs> You're mentioning there the, the sort of the feminine principle in relation to the earth, and, and you touched on, um, you know, the good wishes and the power of, of the divine. And, and that, in a way, is at the opposite end from the earth. It's spirit, isn't it? And I don't know about you, Anita, but, you know, growing up in a, in a Western culture, you absorb this notion that the divine is a masculine principle, yeah. you know, that God is the father, that it's a... And I remember the moment when I heard mention of the divine feminine, and the shock to my system that the divine could have anything to do with the feminine. Um, Genti, could you talk us through something around that sort of idea of, of the two principles flowing in perfect um, equilibrium when it comes to the way in which we relate to the divine? Um, one of the earliest prayers that children are taught in India and within the Indian diaspora um, you are the yeah. mother and the father because the first contact of the child is with the mother and then later with the father and so I know that so many people for myself um, I didn't know who is God and when I looked for answers in Christianity I didn't find when I looked for answers in Hinduism I didn't find I didn't look much further than that I have to say but when I came back to my own inner search. When I started to meditate, the first experience was of God's love. It really was such a powerful experience that it was transformative. And then later you also understand that it's not just the love that's important, but the power that God can give you, the spiritual power that the father figure can give you is also very important. So you begin to relate to mother and father, and you see the value of both together. Just as a human child deprive a child of one of the parents, and there'll be something missing. But the soul also, when come into contact with the mother and father, it changes your perception of the world. And so I think that, yes, there's the worship of the goddesses, but more than that, there's always, always this prayer of God as the mother and father. Mm. And I think that knowing the mother means that that love that is there within you can also be expressed and it emerges. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Um, about how the narrative changed about the, the, the spiritual nature of these goddesses and the acceptance of them. I'm wondering when that changed because in the Western narrative, particularly there's been a number of changes, but say in the 1940s, 50s, women had been very much working. Mm. Men were at war, 
Mm. And then we had to get rid of the women <laughs> so the men could come back and have jobs. Mm. So there was a huge propaganda campaign of mm. the 1950s housewife in the kitchen with all the gadgets and constructed this archetype of women in the home very mm. strongly. And we then forget prior to that, there were so many years when women were working alongside men. Is there a, so, and there are other points, but mm. that was a big point of change in recent history. Is there something that happened in India? There's a point it changed, or was there always a divergence? Um, there are two theories on this. In, in uh, modern India, actually post-1991, uh, India's kind of a dichotomy, once our economic reforms began. So the country with the highest proportion of women in uh, STEM, for example, science, tech, engineering, medicine, is actually India. The women with the highest proportion, uh, the country with the highest proportion of pilots uh, is actually India. The women with the highest, uh, the country with the highest proportion of women in the police and armed forces is actually India. So in some ways, it's dramatic, the changes of the last 30 years. But in some ways, uh, sexual crimes have shot up, you know. So there's like this dichotomy that's, that's happening. Uh, if you see in ancient times for the last thousand years, judging simply by the spiritual texts uh, that are available. Um, uh, you know, you find a lot of liberalism around women, around LGBTs. You know, so Lord Krishna's uh, uh, dynasty was actually founded by a transgender <coughs> called Ila. That's why one of his names is Ila. So in ancient times, there's a lot of uh, liberalism <laughs> about, like I said, all, yeah. all what you'd call uh, sexual minorities or uh, women. Uh, what there's a theory that has been around in India that that parts which experience a lot of random violence then tend to become uh, more patriarchal. So you'll find in the Indian subcontinent the parts which suffered a lot of invasions tended to become a little more patriarchal. Parts which suffered less, like the South. Mm -hmm. South of India is actually not that patriarchal at all. Yeah. But the South never really suffered horrific invasions. Uh, Eastern India is also actually a lot less uh, patriarchal. Uh, so there's this theory that violence, random violence can kind of cause that as well. This is a subject that needs much deeper uh, study because like I said, modern India is actually a dichotomy. In some ways, women from modern times are doing better than ever, in some ways worse than ever. Mm -hmm. And judging by spiritual texts, maybe the invasions actually hurt. So you see the parts of India that actually suffered a lot of invasions have become a lot more patriarchal. Both these theories are there. They need more research, I guess. Mm. Yeah. There's, there's, there's different moments in time around the world where different things happened. And yeah. in True. China, all the emperors were men, except for one female emperor, empress, who yeah. was the most successful, but yeah. then was written out of history, so nobody no. knows about her. In yeah. India, actually, women uh, emperors were actually relatively quite common, actually. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a misnomer to assume that it was only Hindu. There were, uh, you know, there's this, you must read of the Bhopal Begums, for mm -hmm. example. <laughs> Fascinating. Women rulers, Muslim women rulers, the line used to pass from woman to, from mother to daughter for 130 years. Now, many of these things actually, many outsiders are not aware of. So, uh, it's not that strong women were only a Hindu thing. Uh, it was there in Indian Islam uh, as well, actually. But the more communication we've had, the more opportunity we've had to rewrite the history <coughs> in favor of the current thinking or the patriarchal thinking. Mm. There's so much history that, that we just don't know. Um, and, and Anita, I don't know what you feel about, you know, we're, we're talking about women occupying the traditionally masculine space, but there's something about not just doing the work of men, but actually doing it in a different way. Yes, yeah. and for women. And for women. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, I was listening uh, to what you had to say, Sister Giampi, and it making me think that you're absolutely right, you know, uh, to kind of go internal and through spirituality, kind of find your power, both masculine and feminine. I think that's beautiful. And one day, one day, <laughs> I'll get there. Um, but for me, like, getting to where I have and the platform that I have after 20 years of working in, within the mainstream media in Britain, I, the, what the book did, it made me realize that I've had passion my whole life, but now I have purpose. And my purpose oh, is to make sure that I make 
leave this landscape, this rarefied world that I find myself in, different and open doors and throw down ladders and make sure that mm-hmm. I speak the, 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 my truth and my story so that little girls and boys who look like me go, <laughs> okay, fine, let's do this. We can, we can do this. And, and that's kind of where I'm at and that's how I'm using my feminine power, I guess, mm-hmm. um, in a different way, kind of being generous in, in spirit. So in a, a Guardian interview about um, how you would like to be in the future, and you said to be a, a billionaire philanthropist that, you, <laughs> that, that, used, that, your you money, that. that used your money to, to educate women and oh. girls around the world. That is my passion. So I hope you're on your way to your first billion. Um, <laughs> I worked, did I say I worked for the BBC? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, no, I mean, I like you. Like with Education yeah. is... Fundament, it's, my, it's the fact that I am educated, that I have a voice that I can sit in rooms and speak that has given me the power to be where I am. And I have travelled the world, luckily enough, making documentaries around the world. And it's, it's girls' education that, is, that gets them out. And when a, when a girl is educated, as we all know, it's not just, she's not just changing her life. She's going to change the life entire of her family. entire family Very and true. the generations that go afterwards. Very so it's, it's vital. It's mm. the crucial, mm. crucial thing. Very true. Um, both the Dalai Lama and um, Nelson Mandela predicted that it was going to be Western women who would transform the world. You've heard that as a quote. Um, Dalai Lama said Western women are going to save the world, are going to you know, basically <laughs> transform the world. Are we on track for that? Are, are, we, are, we, are we getting there yet? I think, uh, I think women, global feminism is what's changing the world. I, I'm not too sure about the Western thing. I think, and also depending on where you are, what's West? You can just keep going round and round and round, right? Um, I, I think, I know, I have met incredible women everywhere I go. In fact, all the kind of places I go, it tends to be the women that are running the home, that are feeding the kids, that are collecting the water and doing everything. And, yeah, I think... I mean, India... The women in India are just... The women I know in my... The the powerhouses and the conversations that are taking place and the levels they've got to... um, yeah, I think I think so. I think it's a global movement. Yeah, I think probably the situation has moved on. I think so. Globally yeah. from when, when <laughs> the Dalai Lama said. May I add one thing to, to what she said? Uh, because I'm so right with what uh, with what she's saying, and it's an interesting thing that the India and the Bangladesh government seem to be following most practically all the subsidies that are given to the house uh, in India and Bangladesh actually go into the woman's account. They don't go into the man's <laughs> account. Uh, no, seriously, and it's it's actually a policy call. And research has shown that actually that ends up ending helping the entire family uh, a lot more. Uh, these two countries have done that, and actually it has helped social indicators. Well, actually, day. that's happened here as well. Child yes. benefit is paid to the yeah. to the mother and yeah. and not to the father, um, <laughs> and that has been for many years. Um, another question? Do we have another question? Thank you. To me, I am a Hindu. I come from India. A gentleman says we worship motherhood very much. Our goddess Durga is the power behind all of us. Society is changing. When I read the newspaper today, it talks about transgender. One of the newspapers said, if the child is born, she, he or she should not be labeled man or woman. So what is the general vision on your feminist views on the future? <laughs> Hmm. I had that. a feeling this question might come up. It's, it's, <laughs> I've got my 20-year-old daughter here, and she keeps me well informed on the, uh, the current uh, you know, language around non-binary and um, non-gendered inclusivity. Anita, did you have your hand up just then? No, no. <laughs> quite, the op- quite the opposite, Philippa. Quite the opposite. <laughs> I mean, she says something that, that you've spent some time thinking about. I honestly am not deep into the Western (laughs) debate that happens, Mm. but I can tell you how it's approached again from the Indian way. Mm. This is the first time I'm living in the West. I've been an India boy all my life. I've traveled a great deal, but this is the first time I'm living in. uh, So I've been here just two years. But um, Look, in in the Indian way, Sanskrit is actually the only language which originally had a third gender. 
so you don't actually, to, unlike English, gender. you don't actually have to change the language. Sanskrit has it. Okay. Uh, uh, there's in in the language itself. Mm. Uh, uh, that's that's a part of it. Second part of it is at birth, at least. I mean, at least in the Indian way, there was it was believed that you're born with one of three genders. You could be male, female, or transgender. Not something assigned at birth. Uh, but uh, we've had, like I mentioned, Lord Krishna, the founder of of his dynasty. Lord Krishna, one of our most popular gods. The founder of his dynasty was uh, was a transgender called Ila. She founded the dynasty as a woman. She later became a man. Uh, but uh, she was so respected that one of the names of ancient India was Ila Varta, the land of, of Ila. Uh, we have, uh, everyone knows Lord Shiva, obviously, who doesn't? I mean, and I'm a devotee of Lord Shiva. Om Namah Shivaya Kada, Rudraksh Mala. Is, with all respect to all other gods, he's, <laughs> he's a truly cool god. He, he, uh, he's now, a rock star, too. Uh, he talks oh, the yeah. child. <laughs> so now, one of the ways we worship Lord Shiva is uh, a form called Ardha Nareshwar. Uh, half man, half woman. Half Lord Shiva, half his wife, Goddess Parvati. And the interesting thing uh, is the story behind it. Uh, that there was this very, very wise sage who was a deep and devout devotee you know, worshipper of Lord Shiva, you know, as I am, as many are. And his entire thing was, I'll worship only you, no one else, okay? Only you, I don't recognize anyone else. Uh, and Lord Shiva was so angry, uh, to prove a point to him, he actually merged into his wife. So the left part <laughs> is Goddess Parvati, the right part is Lord Shiva. He's worshipped as Ardha Nareshwar, as, uh, you know, half man, half woman. Uh, where he taught to his devotees, there is no difference. Interesting. Uh, and learn, learn mm. to see that. If you see it that way, then many of these mm. modern debates don't appear so... Uh, yeah. Uh, it kind of becomes... Yeah, these, these aren't things worth yeah. fighting over. There are bigger issues, actually. Of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I'm just saying as an Indian. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's fine. You can say that as an Indian. Um, <laughs> but, Sister Genti, is, is there kind of an evolutionary thing going on here, do you think, with... Um, this this kind of character of, of Vishnu that Amish is referring to, which is is the best of male masculine and the best of feminine merged together. Do you think we are moving towards an era where really the differences are not going to be as great as they have been? That there will be balance between the two. Um, I'm sure that even today. Um, when I look at an individual, the training that I've been given through spirituality is not to see externals, but to see yeah. the light that's shining here. And when I see a person in that way, there's a very different relationship with them in which there are no barriers. Yeah. And so otherwise, male, female, Indian, British, black, yeah. white, brown, all of those are boxes, compartments that you slot people into. And you approach them with a mindset that's very fixed. Um, at least that's the usual trend. And yet this training of seeing the light that's shining inside and connecting with that human being as that being is the perfect step of evolution mm -hmm. where you're able to relate to every human being according to the being that they are and not just the physical form. Um, I mean, the very simple example, no matter how beautiful the chariot, the car may be, but it's the quality of the driver that's important and whether they're going to use that chariot in the right way or not use it properly. Same thing, the body is the chariot, so gender, whatever, whatever is secondary. More important than the external is that inner being. And so, yes, I do think we are moving into that era where we are learning to see that being. Beautiful. I love beautiful. That. That's beautiful. That's and really of course, beautiful. the soul is neither male nor female. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Or you can say it's both. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's neither yeah. and it's both. Yeah, <laughs> it's neither um, and it's both. That's I want it. to I want to challenge Amish with oh. an idea that um, I want you to reflect on. Oh. And when you see the shivaling, that's the oh. oval image. Oh. But of course, that's the external oh. image. It's not the real. And my understanding is that. Just as the soul, Atma, is that point of light, mm. Param Atma, Shiva, the Supreme, yeah. is also that point of light. And the word mm. Shiva 
When you translate it, it means the benefactor, mm. it means the point, and it means the seed. Yes, and right. so, at some point, another conversation mm. is to see the difference between Shiva, the Supreme, mm. um, mother and father mm. of all, mm. and that light, that image of light has been remembered through traditions all over the world the in some form or another. Yeah. And the image of Shankar, a little bit different. And so, uh, time for another question about yeah. the yeah. difference between Shiva and Shankar. You are utterly right. You are utterly right. <laughs> 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 so. We're back on our favourite subject of philosophy, aren't we? Yeah. This has been a, a real education, and I'm very grateful indeed. My question, probably for Anita and Sister Genti, is Is it enough? Will it be enough? to educate the women spiritually without also educating the men. men. It yeah. has to it be has together. To be it has to be together. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I was talking about how the awakening within a woman is important, but yeah. equally the awakening of men. And I think the Brahma Kumaris are still today, 21st century, the only spiritual organization that has women leadership that caters for men and women. And so, yes, definitely, my brothers are very much part of our family. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, you, you know, we talk about educating girls and uh, putting, making girls stand on their own two feet, but also how are we raising our sons mm. and what are we teaching our sons? And mm. as Amish pointed out, you know, in, women in India are so successful and mm. are in all walks of life and fields. Uh, however, uh, abuse has never yeah. been more rife or possibly now we are talking about it a lot more. And so, and you know, how much do men need to be able to re just, we need to move men along with us. You know, we need to keep them on track and the conversation has to involve them. It can't just be women charging forward. The men need to understand, you know, it can't be a power struggle constantly. So I think you're right. It's, it's vitally important that we, that we talk to, that men are involved in the conversation. Um, can I want to go back to the image that you shared of Vishnu and four arms and one head. And so it's that symbol of perfect harmony and unity. The head, yes, the direction, you know where you're going and you're focused there, but it's the double energy, man and mm. women working together. And uh, there's another image, which is the opposite, which is also very much there within India, um, ten heads of Ravan. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's ten heads inside in here. One moment my mind is saying one yeah. thing, and next yeah. moment it's... And <laughs> what happened as a result? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So this is the, the Indian um, archetype of Ravan, who symbolizes all that's not good in the world. <laughs> five heads which represent the masculine, and mm. five which represent the feminine. So, again, y mm. you've got the... Um, the two there, and, and Anita, would you you say that in, in a way you've you've embraced your masculine to achieve what you have because yeah. you've you've had to strive and you know you're climbing mountains and conquering <laughs> and you know that is quite masculine energy you've used. I don't know. It's interesting you should say that. I mean, I guess when I was little, I always saw that the boys were treated differently to the girls and they had a bit much better deal. However, in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> Should have bet put your ticket on the girls, shouldn't you? Um, <laughs> you, you backed the wrong horse. Um, but so absolutely, as a young, as a child, I thought, oh, it'd be so much better to be a boy. I could play out and all this. But actually, um, I would, I would say that, in many ways, I guess if you're work, entering corporate world, the corporate world, women have. I mean, it's changing now, but traditionally have had to take on masculine traits in order to succeed in male environments. And not just so that they can succeed, it's so that the men around them don't freak out, you know. However, now that we're getting more women in spaces and we're all rising together, within the workplace we can bring in more feminine energy. But back to what, when I was talking about charging ahead and the power and kind of wanting to succeed and the tenacity that I have and that bit between my teeth, yeah, I guess it is seen as traditionally masculine energy, but I find it so feminine. I find that power within me is my feminine power. I don't know if that makes sense. Something I'm still figuring out now because it's definitely something that has awoken in me in the last five years since I went on a journey to discover what happened to my family and writing the book. And I'm really tapping into something within the energy within me. But right now, I'm, I quite like that it's 
as you say, it's all, all within us. It's masculine, it's feminine. And I think women definitely have a, a power that, that is that is fueled by rage as well, you know? And so I don't maybe know. We, Am I wrong? I don't know. I'm just, I know I, you know, I haven't spent I a lot... I mean, we <laughs> have this idea um, of the Shiv Shakti, yes. of, of the, the Shakti, which is the female principle, and yet inspired with the power of, of Shiv, which is the, the cosmic principle. Mm. Um, and in a way, that's what Anita is talking about. It's, mm -hmm. it's bringing the whole of that energy of the cosmos through yeah. the feminine form and then you have perfection because you you have it all the power of the masculine with the the subtlety of the feminine um, absolutely this term shiv shakti is a beautiful combination mm. of that energy of the divine but also the female form through which that's manifest mm. and they say that the world is transformed by the Shiv Shaktis. Mm. And I believe that as the world is going through its huge transition at this moment, I think it is this energy. But it's not for me the energy of rage, more it's the energy of truth. Truth, yes. And so when there's an awareness of what is right, what is true, then you move towards it and nothing can stop you From there. now on, I'm going to get rid of the word rage and put truth instead. <laughs> you know, truth. It's the energy of truth. Good. Speaking your truth. That is the yeah, truth. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, and that is it. <laughs> when is we it. speak, when yes. we find our voices mm -hmm. and, that, and speak our truth, and I think that's the release for a woman, right? Yeah, no. Correct. I, I, so that you. is the Shakti. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's the transformation uh, in a nutshell, is yes. taking the word rage and transforming it into truth. truth. Mm. Absolutely. And that, on the global scale, would achieve a lot, wouldn't it? There's a bit of a Absolutely. round of applause there, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I think you're right in saying we're living in a time of transformation, and it really is absolutely necessary. And we need the balance of the masculine and the feminine because all is the one energy. It was Albert Einstein who first said, we cannot change the world using the same consciousness that created the problems. Yeah. And I'd just really like to ask about what higher consciousness you see emerging in a world that science is now showing us is one and is interconnected. So that separation can happen no longer. We have to collaborate, we have to rejuvenate. I just wondered what ideas you had that would help this become a real global movement. It's in little pockets everywhere, but we need to really globalize and make this to be a unanimous thing. And it may be the women who have to really start this. I just wondered what bright inspirations you had, because the politicians ain't going to do it. They ain't going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we did, in the final four, have three female candidates for the next prime minister, which I thought They're was well. a good ratio, three to one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think we'll, we'll concede that they're possibly not going to do it. Um, what's, what's the response from the floor on that one? Um, I, I just see how media is such a powerful instrument to bring together those little pockets of energy that you described. Um, and as media brings us together, and social media especially, I know there's a lot to be said about the negative side of social media, but the positive side of social media, and bringing unheard voices out to be able to be heard now. And so I see that media is the way to be able to uplift consciousness and I think that people who are using the media in the beautiful way that both of you or three of you are doing is wonderful because that's the way that the voice gets heard and people begin to look at things differently. Um, I remember there was a situation with Daddy Janki in which we were asking her, well, how do you um, look at, is there another way? You know, here's a situation that I'm saying is not right. But instead of attacking it with rage, can I use the power of truth to transform it? Yeah. And so thinking about, is there another way? She summed it up very well. And she said, use the policy of inside out. Mm. And so when I change inside, then I can transmit that energy. And that energy spreads outside also. Mm. So I'd say the inside out approach, but also the outside, the media is very important. I actually have a, an extra example of what you're talking about, which is, I'm sure some, lots of you here saw the program when Sir David Attenborough made Blue Planet, and we all watched in horror what plastic was doing to our oceans. That moment of television transformed something within Britain, 
and the way we s little children cried at what they were seeing, and they, ha they won't forget. And then a follow-up, I made a programme called War on Plastic, because it was very obvious that people knew that we were doing something terrible, but what can we actually physically do to, to do something about it? And through the power of social media, Twitter, you know, campaigns to get supermarkets to change their policy around packaging, and McDonald's get rid of their plastics, and the power to the people, you know, it worked. And, peop and the conversation has started, but ultimately it's got to be power, the biz big business that make, make changes. Ultimately, it has to be them that, that m we can only do so much. I mean, we can do a lot together, but... I feel like there's going to be quite a lot resting on your shoulders, Anita, as, <laughs> as, our, as our woman in the public, public domain who, who has this potential to bring about change. Yeah. Through truth. Through truth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and likewise, you, Amish, as well, with the power of your pen. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, have, you have the attention of everybody. Um, and you know, I think our message from this evening is that we want to perhaps rise beyond our differences mm. to find that common light energy which we all are and, and, and the unity of that and let that light shine and let any other of the divisions fall away. I'm an optimist, if I may say, ma'am. Uh, mm. I know things appear very dark, but actually, uh, in many ways, uh, humanity has actually never had it better. And it truly is, is in our hands. And the fact that so many have a thirst for uh, philosophy, for things which bring us together, mm. is what will drive the change. I'm, I'm generally an optimist about, <laughs> about humanity. Good. We will, all of us have to be a part of that positive change. Mm. Do you want to come back on that at all? Do you, do you accept this vision of optimism? Thank you. I think optimism and hope and love for all of us, what will take us forward. Yeah. So thank you for your optimism and your <laughs> great exchange. And Anita, we're expecting a lot from you now. <laughs> well, I've got a lot of support, so you know, I'll keep going. And with truth. And with truth. <laughs> and with <laughs> truth. <laughs> truth. Well, I think we've arrived at a, at a good place with hope, optimism and truth as our, um, I won't say weapons because... <laughs> They're not weapons, as, as, our, as our tools <laughs> that we're going to carry forwards um, from this evening. We're going to close with a meditation, and I'd like to invite Sister Genty to, to just lead us uh, with some, some words of hope uh, and inspiration to take us into that experience. Thank you, Sister Genty. Thank you. I'll share a few thoughts and invite you to follow those ideas. Going within, coming to the awareness of the inner being that I am, I feel the light that's shining in the center of the forehead. And in this awareness, I can feel the presence of the divine and the connection with the divine the being of light. And this light allows that which is the highest within myself to emerge. And the light sustains this so that it flourishes and can be expressed in my life, in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. And the light extends to the whole human family And the light transforms the darkness of the night into the day. And as we change and allow the highest to reflect in our behavior, in all our deeds, we bring about the day.
a day of light, of justice, of truth, of love. And humanity expresses itself <coughs> in its most beautiful reflection of the divine. Om Shanti. Shanti.